So many people think that the, the Large Hadron Collide has been built to find one particle, which is probably the Higgs particle. And, and that's not really the underlying goal. That, that is one of the particles that's out there. You've got to, you've, you've got to imagine that when, when we try to describe nature, when we try to describe the forces of nature, we have a model, we have a mathematical model in which we find there are these particles present. And one of them happens to be the Higgs particle. It's the particle that will give masses to objects in the universe, to, to, to other particles in the universe. But there are other, proper t other particles that have been predicted that we believe should be there because there are other symmetries present in the universe that are uh, in these models, or we hope these symmetries are there. One of them is called supersymmetry. This is a symmetry that relates two types of particles that you wouldn't otherwise think have been related. Some are called fermions and some are called bosons. They're usually thought to be disparate particles, they interact a bit, but that's about it. These actually relate them. You can, for every fermion, you can have a corresponding boson. For every boson, you can have a corresponding fermion. Now, this property of supersymmetry means that there are some new particles out there. We, I've just suddenly doubled the number of particles, right? We have our fermions, our electrons, our neutrinos. We know they exist. I've just created some bosonic partners of them. Where are they? We haven't seen them. Similarly, we have our bosons. We have things that, which are many you might know as the force carriers, things like the photon, things like the graviton, things that mediate the forces between objects. Supersymmetry creates a whole load of fermion counterparts of them, gravitinos. Just add eno at the end and you're away. You've got all your particles. Now, we've not found any of these supersymmetric par par particles. Now, either they're not there and we're wrong, possible, hope not, but it's possible, or they're there and they've got a very high mass. And if they've got a high mass, the hope is that the Hadron Collider, which can reach the energies from which are able to create these particles, will find them. And, and so there's a whole slew of particles that people are looking for, not just the Higgs particle, but a whole slew of particles with, which people are looking for as evidence of uh, our model. And one of the more exciting aspects is the possibility that maybe we'll see evidence for extra dimensions. If these particles have a high mass, mm. why can't you find them in nature? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, if you could reach the kind of energies where you um, would find them, then you, you'll see them. But these particles can decay, so apart from the, the ones that will form the dark matter. So the ones that are formed the dark matter, they don't interact electromagnetically with things. And so we can't see them by scattering light off them, for example, because they just don't interact that way. The, the way that we have to see them is either through what is known as the weak interaction or through gravity, the effect of gravity. And so searches are on to find these. One will be in the Large Hadron Collider, where it will be the weak interaction which takes place. And the other will be, and then there are also big experiments deep underground where they're trying to also find these particles through the weak interaction. And then in astronomy, we're trying to find evidence for them by looking at their, the effect of having a big mass of these dark matter particles, say in the centre of our galaxy, and seeing how the effect, here's a photon of light, by the way, if you wonder what my finger's doing, photon of light comes by, and then as it gets affected by this big dark mass of dark matter, will be bent, because that's what Einstein told us would happen to light, and under the influence of mass, it'll get bent. And then we can look for evidence of that bending. So it's difficult to find because they don't interact electromagnetically, they, uh, that's why they're dark, and most of, most of the candidates have decayed away, leaving us only with these few residual dark matter candidates. So yes, what if, what if these particles don't exist? Why do people believe they exist? And this is, um, there is no evidence for supersymmetry, sadly, and these, these part of these particles are supersymmet supersymmetric particles. And uh, I think for many particle physicists, it's getting slightly worrying that, you know, it's been, a, it's been around as a proposition for, for a long time the, that these particles should be there, and they've not yet been found. And in fact, there are now constraints on the allowed properties that these particles can have because we've not seen them. If the Higgs is, if it's everywhere, and it's giving everything a mass, you might imagine, yeah, I should be able to just look out the door and find it. But again, it interacts very weakly with these particles. And so 
we can only detect something if we can get a strong interaction with it or if we, our, our detectors are sensitive enough to be able to immediately pick up a deviation or a, an, a result of an interaction with that particle. The Higgs interacts very weakly with most of these particles to such an extent that you have to either have a huge bit of detecting equipment to pick up its, its production and, and therefore its consequences or you need a, a, you know, something like the LHC in order to find its impact uh, due to two particles colliding, perhaps creating a Higgs which then will decay away again. And it, the process happens very quickly. It doesn't live for a long time when it's created and then it disappears on you. Have you met Peter Higgs? I did. Tell I, me about it. I met Peter Higgs. I was very lucky. I met him a few times, but one particular moment I felt a bit embarrassed. <laughs> Sorry for him. I was a student in uh, the uh, mid 80s, I'm afraid that old, yes, I know, I don't look it, but yeah, that old. And I went to a summer school in Scotland, the Scottish University Summer School, you know, a really famous summer school that they have. And Peter Higgs was there because it was in Edinburgh, and somebody had uh, drawn, one of the students had drawn on the blackboard this, this man with a cape and with a big S on it, and we'd put Super Higgs <laughs> below it, and he came in and uh, I had never met him before, this was the first time, and I hadn't, re hadn't realised what a shy person he can be. <laughs> and he just looked totally embarrassed when he saw this picture on the blackboard that we had all done in sort of, as a kind of an, a, on, in honour of him. And he kind of looked at it and it was as if, oh, not again. <laughs> it gets it all the time. And that was back in the 80s, of course. So, yes, I, I met him then and met him over dinner and it was, yeah, he's a nice man. Do you think he's got it right? I hope he's got it right. And it's, I should, should point out, Higgs, Higgs is, of course, has got the name, and it's called Higgs Particle, but I think he would be the first to acknowledge that there are actually probably six people involved. And I was delighted this year when the American Physical Society, they're about to award a, a, a prize in honour of uh, these six people, all of whom effectively came up with the same idea of of how particles can acquire mass. Higgs did it first for a particular case, but that particular case was not the one that we ex see explored in the standard model. That's not the one that's used. It's the basis of it, but it's got extra ingredients. And other people came up, uh, including a good friend of mine, Tom Kibble, came up with the idea um, around the same time, and they have all been acknowledged for it.